Well, greetings, everyone. My name is Amal Matu, and welcome to episode number five of the Resuscitation Vcast. This month, we're going to spend a little time with Dr. Ingrid Lim. Dr. Lim is an outstanding young emergency physician who is an assistant clinical professor at University of California, San Francisco. She works at Kaiser Permanente out there, and she does a lot of great lectures on a potpourri of topics. The topic that we're going to spend some time talking with her or listening to her talk about uh, has to do with abdominal pain in pregnancy. She gave this lecture at the UCSF Topics in Emergency Medicine Conference, which was held in November 2011. And she talked about an assortment of different topics. You can get the full assortment on the CME Download website. We're only going to spend a few minutes focusing in on the section from her talk that talked about some particular pitfalls that have to do with a killer in pregnancy, and that is ectopic pregnancy. So let me hand things over to Ingrid, and I will be back shortly. I just want to spend a few moments talking about ectopic pregnancy because it is still the leading cause of non-traumatic uh, pregnancy-related deaths, accounting for 10 to 15 percent of all maternal deaths. The incidence has actually um, increased sixfold since 1970, and nowadays it accounts for 2 percent of all pregnancies, which is really high in my book. Um, risk factors, the highest, the biggest risk factor is having a prior ectopic. That increases your likelihood um, by 7 to 13 fold um, of having a recurrence. Um, and nowadays with assisted reproduction, by the way, 1% of all um, infants born in the United States nowadays is conceived by uh, assisted reproduction. So we've definitely seen this, and I'm sure you've seen it in the ER, and patients that are getting induction uh, ovulation by Clomid um, or in vitro fertilization that's accounting for more ectopic pregnancies. Clomid alone actually quadruples your risk of ectopics. Um, and then heterotopics, um, the, the presence of having a, an intrauterine pregnancy plus an ectopic pregnancy, it's pretty rare. At baseline, it's only 1 in 20,000. However, you should be aware that, um, that heterotopics are really much, much more common in the patients getting assisted reproductive technology. So it's been quoted in the literature as 1 out of 100 or 1 in 400 chance. So definitely think about that in those patients. Okay, so let's just recap a couple of important points. First point is that ectopic pregnancy, prior ectopic pregnancy is probably the biggest risk factor, no big surprise there, but any type of assisted reproductive uh, fertilization, anything like that is gonna put the patient at much higher risk of an ectopic pregnancy or heterotopic pregnancy. And that's a, a bit of a surprise to me, not that you have an increased risk, but the numbers are surprising. Back when I was in residency, we were taught that if you diagnose an intrauterine pregnancy, the chance of there being a concurrent ectopic pregnancy, in other words, a heterotopic pregnancy, an IUP plus an ectopic, is probably about 1 in 40,000. And they would say that standard of care is pretty much that if you diagnose an IUP, you're done. You don't have to look for an ectopic pregnancy, but that's not true any longer because if someone has gone through assisted reproduction, then the chance of heterotopic pregnancy may be as high as one in a hundred, maybe up to one, one in a hundred, up to one in 400, but that's an incredible increased risk for heterotopic pregnancy. So if you diagnose the IUP and the patient was uh, involved in some type of in vitro fertilization or use of Clomid and so on, well, your job is not necessarily done. It's a very important point to keep in mind. Uh, the classic triad of abdominal pain, uh, amenorrhea, and vaginal bleeding is um, only present in less than half of ectopic pregnancies. Other symptoms that patients might have, uh, shoulder pain if there's uh, fluid under the diaphragm. They might have an urge to defecate um, if there's uh, fluid in the posterior cul-de-sac. And this is an interesting thing. A lot of them present like gastroenteritis, so they have nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. So definitely beware of those patients that look just like gastroenteritis if they have a significant amount of abdominal pain. So gastroenteritis is the most common misdiagnosis sitting on the chart of cases of missed appendicitis. It's a common diagnosis on the chart of delayed or misdiagnoses of mesenteric ischemia, and it's a common misdiagnosis in missed cases or delayed cases of ectopic pregnancy. So I will reiterate the words of Dr. Greg Henry, gastroenteritis is the diagnosis of the intellectually destitute. Well, maybe that's a little overboard, but just be careful. Anytime you write gastroenteritis on a chart of somebody that you're about to send home, think twice 
about something deadly that you might be missing. Remember that 30% of ectopics have no vaginal bleeding, 36% have no adnexal tenderness, and only 10% have a palpable adnexal mass. I think we were all taught in medical school that uh, if the beta HCG did not double in 48 hours, that that signified an abnormal uh, pregnancy or an ectopic. And that is actually no longer the definition for um, a, a normal rise in beta. So nowadays with the newer assay technologies, the minimum or the, the lowest acceptable rate of rise in HCG levels actually increased by 53% in 48 hours. Um, so the median rate of rise is still about 124% in 48 to 72 hours. So 85% of women still have a doubling of their beta in two to three days, but it's perfectly acceptable if they only have an increase by half in 48 hours. So that's a huge paradigm shift from what we were previously taught. Um, one important point that I want to mention is that you should really emphasize to your patients that they need to go back to the same lab to get their betas drawn because there is wide variability um, in assay, serum quantitative assay uh, tests. So you want to make sure that they go back to the same lab to get it drawn. And this next two points are really important. So just because, so if you have a normal rise in HCD, that does not exclude a spontaneous abortion or an ectopic. So true, most of the time for these, for ectopics, you'll see a slower rise, but it doesn't necessarily, they can also have a normal rise as well and still have an ectopic. Um, and there is no beta HCG level at which you could exclude an, exclude an ectopic. So it used to be thought that if, they were, if the beta HCG was really low or super high, like over 20,000, that it was not likely to be an ectopic. That's not true. You can have it at any level, um, actually even zero. Um, so if you want to really lay awake at night, this last point is, <laughs> is what you should remember, that 3% of ectopics that are taken to the OR actually will have a negative serum, I mean negative, i.e. zero um, beta HCG level. And that's because the theory is that you need a viable trophoblast to make beta HCG. So if you have a, an ectopic that isn't producing, uh, doesn't have a viable trophoblast, it's not producing beta HCG, you can't measure it. Or maybe the beta has actually, I mean the um, ectopic has actually died and then ruptured and and that's why you have a zero uh, beta HCG. So we actually had one of these in our department a month ago um, where we had an ectopic pregnancy and a negative serum HCG. So let me just emphasize some of those points that Ingrid made there towards the end. First of all, you don't need to have the classic vaginal bleeding plus abdominal pain uh, when you're pregnant to be worried about an ectopic pregnancy. You can have one or the other. Bottom line is if the woman is pregnant and she's got vaginal bleeding or she's got abdominal pain, go ahead and get that ultrasound. Second important point, we all learned that the quantitative HCG should double every 48 hours. It turns out that even a normal pregnancy does not necessarily have to double every 48 hours. The minimum accepted rise is only about 50% in 48 hours. So even if it's not completely doubling, as long as it's rising, that could be an important and good sign. But then on the other hand, an ectopic pregnancy can actually double or have a, a fairly normal looking or sounding rise in those first 48 hours. So you can't rule out an ectopic pregnancy just because you are getting that quant to double every 48 hours. And then the last important point, really important point that she made, is that there's no specific quantitative HCG that will rule in or rule out uh, an ectopic pregnancy. And she even pointed out that there's about 3% of cases of ectopic pregnancy, including a recent case in their own emergency department of a patient that had a negative or essentially a zero quantitative HCG, but they were concerned enough about the symptoms that they went all the way to get the ultrasound and they made the proper diagnosis. So there's no specific quant that rules this out. Granted, a quant of zero would be very rare. They said only 3% or so, but if you're worried, just get the ultrasound. Don't take chances on this. And very small ectopics have been known to rupture and produce a a significant hemorrhage. So be very careful about that. So my kudos and thanks to Dr. Ingrid Lim for a great lecture. You can hear Ingrid lecturing on a handful of other topics on CME Download. And she also lectures fairly regularly at the ASEP Scientific Assembly and sometimes at AAM and a handful of other great conferences, especially in the San Francisco area. So check out her lectures 
And uh, again, remember, Resuscitation 2013, May 1st through May 5th is going to be a fantastic conference. And I look forward to either seeing you there or at the very least talking to you about some more great lectures that we've got on CME Download in the coming weeks or month or so. Until then, take care, everyone.